<laughs> so thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. We're going to be talking today about uh, practical deep learning for coders. Uh, this webinar is really uh, a preview of the course that we're going to be teaching here at Cigar Global starting next month. Um, and uh, so today, I think even if you decide not to take the course, I think we'll have some some interesting information for you that that will give you some some more idea of what's going on. With, uh, Basically, today what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, of course, give an introduction, uh, we're going to, which we've already done, more or less, we'll introduce ourselves, talk a little bit about sort of global, um, and then we're going to give you some background on AI, deep learning, um, and, and go jump into some examples of actual code, uh, why you might be interested in doing it, and, uh, and uh, what we'll be teaching in the course. So you'll actually get your hands dirty, at least in seeing some real code that does, that does deep learning today, so I think uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, just a, a quick introduction of ourselves. Uh, my name is Adam Beglin. Um, I have a PhD in computer science. I uh, used to teach at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. That's where Paul and I met uh, back in the 90s. Um, and then we both uh, escaped Pittsburgh, the West Coast. Um, I did uh, tech startups in the Bay Area for a couple of decades. And then uh, I've been in, in Puerto Rico now for three years. So excited to be here and excited to get to Colorado. And I did very much the same thing as Adam, except I was Adam's student. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> did he give you a good grade? And I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah and I took a course, a course with Adam, and then um, went to do my thesis, and I asked Adam to be my advisor. So and then we stayed in touch. We both moved out to the Bay Area at the same time and worked in tech. And Adam moved here a couple years ago, and uh, my wife and two of our sons moved here. Uh, Came up to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you wanna... Sure. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Sagrado Global. Uh, my name is Jorge Silva. I uh, am the director of this uh, School of Professional Studies. And uh, I want to first thank everyone who's here present in face-to-face -face session and also all of those who are via Zoom, uh, via video conference. We have people as far away as Texas. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I want to give you a very quick overview of what Sagrado Global is and how it works. What you see here on the screen is the evolution of what used to be a division of continuing studies. And we have turned it into a school of professional studies because we want to emphasize precisely topics like artificial intelligence, data analytics, uh, web design, and many other topics that are not only very much needed in Puerto Rico, but also of uh, high demand. And uh, even though this, this particular class is taught in English, we do uh, have an extensive offer of classes in Spanish as well. And the idea to do it in the context of this classroom is precisely, and the reason why we call ourselves global, is because we want to make sure that we can bring to the uh, Puerto Rican students talent from whatever they are in the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, this initiative started as part of uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Maria when we uh, offered about 25 courses remote uh, with professors who were from all different parts of the uh, mainland US. And uh, it was a, a, an interesting experiment that led us to develop this virtual classroom. Well, you can interact with us uh, even if you're in Texas or if you prefer to be here face to face, you can do that as well. Some of the topics that uh, we are covering, as I said, is the web design, e-commerce, data science, and digital marketing. Right now we have approximately 4,000 participants per year, and we offer close to 300 courses per year. Uh, the idea is one of a lifelong learning offering. And uh, basically what you see on this screen is how the virtual classroom works and you're experiencing right now. The idea is that this class, the moment we finish with it, will automatically upload to the cloud. So you have the choice. You can either come to the classroom, you can view from the uh, comfort of your home, or if uh, that particular time doesn't work for you, you will also be able to, uh, to, to watch it in a, recorded, in a recorded session. This, for example, is a professor, uh, Lassen Tijano, and he's transmitting from Madrid, Spain. Uh, and he's teaching a class right now, a communications class right here. So again, welcome her to, to Sagrado Global. Thank you very much, Adam and Paul, for helping us uh, launch this uh, 
what I hope very successful experiments. And I'll let you uh, continue with the program. Thank you. So, one of the themes of the class we'll be teaching is very hands on. And on the first lesson, you're building deep learning systems and you're running them in your So, we thought we would do the same thing in this presentation and kick off with a example of deep learning algorithm. We're going to teach a computer to add numbers. I know, I can see the excitement on your faces. But, but uh, we're going to make it a little bit more complicated. So, here's what we're going to do I am going to be using, in this case, this environment called Mathematica. It's very similar to the environment that uh, uh, that we'll be using in the, in the class. So here's the question. If we give the computer enough examples, can it learn to add numbers? So you're going to say, well, computers already know how to add numbers. Right? Yes, I know. And in fact, if I have two numbers, let's say 123 plus well, 123 plus 789, and I execute that, it gives me the answer. But we're not going to give it numbers as actual integers. We're going to give it strings. So we're going to say to the computer, here's a string of seven characters, 123 plus 789, and the computer doesn't know what to do with it, right? It just says, okay, well, that's a string. Yeah, that's fine. In fact, if I ask the computer you know, to show me the codes, the numbers that it has, for it, how it interprets this, well, one is actually number 49, and then two is 50, 51, and plus is 43. What does that mean? That means that to the computer, 120, a string of saying 123 plus 789 means nothing. How well it did. And that's what it uses the test data for. It runs through, it trains on the training data, and it says, okay, how well did I do on the test data? Oh, not very well. All right, then I'm trained a little bit more on the training data, but I do any better. And the output is you get something like this. It doesn't look very different, but it just shows you that it's an issue. I'm going to show you some pictures of what it looks like while it's training. This takes about five to ten minutes on an iPad, so we don't want to make you sit through the actual training. When we just start, two seconds in, you know, it's barely started. It, it, it's got a 67, 60, sorry, 69% error rate. So it's making a lot of mistakes. If we scroll down a little bit, after 21 seconds, 5% in, the error rate is about 50%. So that means that when it's running through its tests, half the time it's really not getting, it's basically getting the wrong, the wrong answer. Uh, not very good as far as a, something that you want to rely on for addition. As we move down, after a minute, the error rate's about a third. And you can see the validation error is here. And here, these graphs, basically, this one is the most interesting one, the error rate on the bottom. It just shows you the error rate slowly falling down as it's going through round after round after round. Two minutes in, we now have an error rate of 12%. By the way, if you notice here the Atom optimizer, you will learn all about Atom. Both atoms <laughs> in the class. <laughs> the atom I'm sitting with and the algorithm. And I am hoping that maybe a student will want to create an optimizing algorithm called Paul. And name it after Paul. But Adam has an algorithm, a deep learning algorithm named after Paul. Three minutes. My error is down to 8%. Five minutes. Now we're down to 3% error. You can also see these spikes here. This is an example of the neural network trying to kind of jump out and look for different options. Maybe there's a slightly better solution in this problem space. Maybe if I change the parameters a little bit, but as it's doing so, things are getting worse. It's like, oh no, that doesn't work. And that's that's why you're seeing. After about you know seven to eight minutes, it finishes. So the question is, will it work? I'm sure that's what you guys are wondering. So we're gonna start with some simple tests. So now we're gonna we have a trained network. We're gonna give it a string. We're gonna say, what is 123 plus 789? We give this the answer. Which is a string again, it doesn't look like it, but um, if I do this, we'll see the characters are, but the big stuff is characters. But the, um, this is actually uh, obviously the right answer. I can give some different 
different uh, and new, a string of uh, problems to it. And we'll see what it says. There's two. There's 34, it says 198. Hmm. You notice that? Yeah. Anybody notice a problem there? Yeah, 34. 34, right? 10 plus 25, not quite that. It's not perfect. But think about what the computer did, right? In 10 minutes, this neural network, which had no concept of numbers, no concept of addition, no understanding that a number, like the number one here actually represents the hundreds, no concept of carry. You know, three plus nine is 12, which means you have to, you know, there's a tens that has to get onto the next uh, side. And so it doesn't know any of that, and yet it's able to add. Is there a way to find out what drove the mistake, the 34? That's a very good question, and it's often very hard. So the question for people, I don't know if I've already heard, but how do we find out how it was 34, right? Why 34 and not 35? Uh, one thing that we could do is the actual, you know, we could look at the last layer that's outputting this and see, you know, these are all probabilities. So what it actually outputs before that is, I think the first character should be a three. And I think the first character should, the second one should be a four, and then I think the third one should be a space, and then another space, because it's always thinking. And it's possible that four and five were very high, and the four was just a little bit high. So this is something that we could do, we could look at and say, all right, well, you know, um, that's that's a, one of the reasons. But can you actually determine? That's a question for, a good question. Can you figure out Correct. why? <laughs> yes. uh, we could ask the Adam and Agar. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, it's actually a, a question very much in, in discussion right now. Is how do you know why an algorithm actually does it? It's not easy to do these deep learning. <clears throat> so if we just run through the whole set, the whole uh, test data set, we can see that we're getting almost 99% accuracy, which isn't bad. Um, actually, I should ask, uh, does anybody want to uh, throw out some, just to, just to prove that this is not, this is not fake? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have thought this. Any of them? Three numbers plus three numbers. Three digits plus three digits, so two digits, three digits, anybody? Sure. I don't know, let's see, uh, 150. 150 plus? Plus uh, 780. 150 plus 780. Right. Anybody else? Let's do one more. Anybody? 85. 85. Plus 93. Plus 93. All right. Check the Zoom chat. Now, you may wonder, what happens if we give it the unexpected? So this is not unexpected, right? And it gets, gives us the answer, 333. Now instead of three digits, we're giving it four digits. So the behavior here is, hmm, who knows, right? Okay. Algorithm <laughs> has never seen four characters and four characters of plus. So it's kind of thinking maybe there's a four in there somewhere, or there's four, I gotta do something. If we had a five characters plus five characters, it's like, well, I know the last character would be a three, but, or if we give it multiple pluses, yeah, it's like it's very okay. It's thinking, all right, well, three plus three is six, and then there's this other three at the end. I'm not sure what to do with that. Anymore. So you can see that um, that's also something you notice, right? When when you stray outside of the bounds of what the neural network has been taught, it can sometimes be very quite significant. Right? So you have to understand just when you're building uh, any application what its limitations are and what the boundaries of its use. That's a simple example, but hopefully you get the sense of what a deep learning algorithm can do with some very like, simple rule, also simple data, and just applying you know, enough data added and the deep learning um, techniques. So that has hopefully went. There are lots of opportunities uh, to use this new technology in your business, in, in your hobbies, perhaps. Um, uh, there. There definitely is, is a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity, and what, the thing that really struck me as we started uh, looking into understanding deep learning, um, it's not so hard. <laughs> it's actually not as hard as you might think. Uh, there are now super fast computers with, with GPUs that make this this work 
uh, pretty pretty amazing. Uh, you know, Paul was training this network at the end of the, the session here. We'll train uh, a neural network that does uh, image recognition and can, can distinguish uh, many different kinds of pet breeds, right? That maybe humans might have different difficulty distinguishing. We can do that in a few minutes, right? In this class, uh, it's just amazing how how well uh, this stuff works and, and how pretty much with the high level tools, um, how easy it is. So I think in your in your in your work today, in your business, you might be able to use this. Um, you might think of ways to enhance your products, um, and also if you can add deep learning to your products, maybe it's it's good for marketing as well. Um, personally, I think it's it's just a very interesting uh, area to study. Uh, this whole whole uh, deep learning area. Um, and if you were uh, in your professional life, if you understand deep learning, there's just incredible demand these days for people who can do this work. And you don't necessarily have to be a computer science major, right? If you know a little bit of programming and you have expertise in the domain, you can take your domain knowledge, whether that's uh, chemistry or, or, or medicine or whatever it is, and then use a little bit of programming skills to actually build things that are pretty interesting. So I think that's that's also what what um, you should think about if you think about taking taking this course. Um, and sort of fun. So, let me ask the audience, and also people uh, people at home or wherever you are, what are examples of AI that uh, you guys have heard about or are aware of? Feel free to. Watson. Watson, yeah, IBM Watson, that won the Jeopardy uh, uh, <coughs> quiz show. So that's an example of artificial intelligence. What else? I was talking of the example of uh, in, in game development where you have uh, enemy agents finding their way towards a uh, player. Uh, you know, so so it, it's more pathfinding. It's uh, pathfinding. I, I, I'm learning your obstacles exactly. and kind of yeah. move around the sure. virtual world. Yep. Anybody else? Anybody on the chat? Chatbots. <laughs> oh, there you go. Chatbots came up on the chat. Okay, chatbots are doing that. That is a good one, actually. And uh, it's gotten some companies in trouble with player rights. Uh, Microsoft released a chatbot not too long ago and on Twitter and people started teaching it to say really bad things and after 24 hours, Microsoft took the chatbot down. They trained on the wrong kind of data. Uh, they haven't put a chatbot up there since. Um, but, so let's, let's look at some examples, right? What are some of the things that... Uh, so we've talked about image recognition, facial recognition, <laughs> Here is an example too of a, an artificial system or AI system that's actually recognizing parts of the face and even the expression of the face, right? And of course, the Mona Lisa can only be neutral with probably lots of thoughts behind it, but it's neutral. Speech recognition is also something that's uh, very much in use. We have optical character recognition. It's one of the, one of the oldest uses, uh, commercial uses of uh, neural networks. Here, even in the 90s, we didn't have any algorithms, deep learning algorithms, but in the 90s, we were starting to, to do this kind of work. So, so if you have a scanner, pretty much guaranteed that inside that scanner is a neural network model that's, that has learned to recognize characters. We also have translation. In this case, we have uh, American English to Chinese, and uh, you know, fortunately, translators don't, aren't shy of, uh, of uh, you know, doing the translation. But if anybody has used translate for google.com, uh, it's amazing how good it is. Right? And that's all trained on a significant amount of data in a very small algorithm, which is just upgraded recently. Uh, there's more, of course. If you guys are not paying attention to this presentation, then maybe because you're using your phone. And if you're typing something on your keyboard, almost certainly the predictive uh, keyboard that you're using has a neural network inside it and is learning from you. So what is the next character they typically put? What is the next word? Uh, just yesterday, Google released, Google has this keyboard called the Gboard, and they released a new um, version of Gboard that has a built-in speech recognition model. It takes 80 megabytes, and it's completely on, on phone. So if you are doing text, sorry, speech to text, and you're talking to your phone, in most cases, it's sending your data out and coming back. Now, Google have a model that offline, it'll do the, the translation. 
with this, this use of it, which is pretty cool. 80 megabytes running on a small device. In fact, you have multiple, multiple uh, neural networks in your phone. Many uh, camera apps are neural networks as well to improve your talent. Who can tell me which company makes these? Google. Google, that's right. Google self driving car. Not quite as nice looking as a Tesla, but it, it, it is working, right? So these are, this is full of neural networks, recognizing trees and pedestrians and cats and all sorts of things. We have more. Uh, many articles online are actually written by uh, deep learning systems. If you've written a summary, if you've read a summary of a, of a sports game or maybe some business news, a lot of it is that. There's a company in China called PyDance, which the majority of the content they produce, they're very successful unicorn in China, is all written by algorithm. Recommendation systems. Now you may not have been to a, a supermarket where when you picked up the bananas, they said you might want the carrots, but you use Netflix or Amazon, and, and this is a very, very important thing. If Amazon can recommend a great uh, buyer to go with whatever you're purchasing, it will make more money. Same thing, Netflix wants you to keep watching. Last but not least, who can tell me who this person is? And why Why is he famous? Computer generated? Computer generated, that's right. This person does not exist. It was actually generated, and I put it here because, I mean, he looks so real, right? And he was generated by two different neural networks. It's called an adversarial network. You have one network that's good at recognizing faces, and another network that wants to be good at generating them. And it gen the one that generates them says, hey, what do you think of this? And the other one goes, that's terrible. All right, I'll try again. And that's what it does, over and over. And they basically compete, one trying to fool the other. And you end up with solutions like this, which is really amazing. So as you can see, there is a ton of interesting things that you can do with uh, the neural networks and the deep learning algorithms. So with that, I guess, oh, that's right, I have one more slide. Now, I'm just showing the exciting stuff. There is also lots of exciting stuff, but I'm not going to go through this whole slide. Much harder for people here to read than folks that are online. But these are all examples of business systems or business processes that have used or are using artificial intelligence. So you've got, for instance, in the hospitality industry, dynamic pricing. So Airbnb uses neural networks or deep learning systems to figure out how to price, you know, to optimize. Actually, there are companies that write on top of Airbnb that can do that for you, I should say. I don't know that Airbnb does it, but there are companies that will look at that data and figure out, oh, it's you have a, a, an apartment in this location at this time, at this time of the year, we can up the rent because there's well, that's why you were sometimes charged with you. That's why you were search prices, search prices, that's right. You also have my favorite, now we're going to be doing a class, automated test scoring or essay scoring, right? Why read 50 different essays when you can get a computer neural network <laughs> and grade it? And then if someone like Jorge says, well, sir, why did I get a two? And you're going to be like, well, you need to talk to the neural network. <laughs> exactly. But more seriously, there are lots of things that you can do with, on the business front. With All right, so the question you must be asking yourselves is do I need to be a rocket scientist in order to learn about deep learning, in order to take this class, etc.? What do you think the answer is? No, I should say yes, I would be in trouble. The answer is no, right? The good news is that you don't, you know, you don't have to learn how to program a deep learning system from the ground up. Although by the end of the class, you'll have a pretty good idea of how you might do it if you really wanted to. There are two main systems uh, out there in the wild right now that are in open source that are used for deep learning. One is called TensorFlow, the other is called PyTorch. So who can tell me who makes, who, who created TensorFlow? Which company? Is it Google? Google, yes, that's right. Google created TensorFlow. And who created PyTorch? PyTorch, anybody in the chat? No, a predictive keyboard. <laughs> Facebook, which maybe what some people were looking at instead of looking at this person. <laughs> so, Facebook. Now, these are both 
very popular deep learning, uh, deep learning tools. The class that we're leveraging for this, for this course uses PyTorch. And so what's, this is what we're going to be using. So the Py in Python, PyTorch means Python, uh, but it is uh, an open source tool. We have quick code, code source, uh, source code, I should say, freely available. So what, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, what do you need to take this class? Well, you have to have programming knowledge. If you've never programmed before, this is going to be very difficult for you. Now, that said, it doesn't have to be a lot, but you know, if you've never programmed before, it will be hard to understand when we start looking inside of PyTorch and some of the code, how it really works. You have to have high score math. We're going to be multiplying matrices, not by hand, but just so, some fairly simple concepts. It's not a ton of mathematics. You have a little bit of calculus and may help a little bit, but honestly, with high school math, you can, you can be fine. Uh, if you know Python, that will definitely help you. But if you learn the programming language, Python is very easy to use. It's also a very useful language to know. Because it is pretty much the de facto language for much of deep learning, and it's it's the most fastest growing, I don't know the most widely used, but certainly one of the most fast, one of the fastest growing um, languages. TensorFlow is also based on Python. Sorry. TensorFlow is actually written in Java. In Java. I could be wrong. But, uh, uh, otherwise, they would have called it PyTensorFlow. Because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, they're sure. not called PyTensorFlow, then the set of Python people wouldn't have used it. The last important thing that you need to know to take this class is you have to be fluent in English. <laughs> because <laughs> nosotros no podemos enseñar una clase de so, uh, the basis for the class is an online course called Class Calera. And they've been doing this for a few years. They're really good. They, in fact, it's so good, their goal is to make your networks uncool again. Uncool because they just want to demystify. They want people to realize that it isn't as hard as you think to learn deep learning systems. The course itself is free uh, online. The online course is free. But you will need, as well as for this class, at least a, uh, a subscription to a cloud computing environment that has a GPU, which there are a number of them that you can use. A few are free. Typically, it's probably for $20 a month to just run something and put that in my eyes and watch out and be very specific. Now, the class contents is here on the right. I won't go through everything, but you'll see, you know, we start by going through some high level hands on examples, like classifying images, you know, figuring out multi level classification. So it's both a chair and a piece of furniture, for example. Uh, and then we dig into more and more. Adam and I will also be inviting a company here in Puerto Rico that a startup that's actually using AI. They use TensorFlow, but they use AI in production. Without, without deep learning, the company would not exist. And so they'll come and talk to, uh, talk to students as well. And the last uh, session will be for student presentations. So we will be presenting projects or uh, groups, groups who present projects. Okay? Now, you may be asking, well, if class AI is free, why would I want to take the second class, which is has a fee attached to it? So there are some reasons, although you are definitely uh, more than welcome to go you know, to take a class AI course on your own. So you get great real world facilities and online Zoom, the ability to watch presentations again and everything. And you can be in your you can be at home in your bedroom taking the class if you want, or joining in, or you can be at a park. You also have collaboration with students and faculty. Some people like the idea, the fact that they have a class to go to that kind of pushes them along and you know, is a forcing function. Uh, you will have an AI-based company presenting. Uh, there's the ability to have an online certificate granted from Sagada that you can have that and use that for yourself. All the fees go to Sagada. Adam and I, and I'm doing this, we're doing this because we're passionate about technology and not we're not making any money with this. Um, but the last thing that you will get out of this class are really friendly instructors. 
Which <laughs> 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 maybe some people may think is maybe the best thing. <laughs> so when and where is this class? Well, when is easy. We start on the 10th of April, and we go for eight weeks. So all the Wednesdays through the last Wednesday in May. We'll be going from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. There will be some homework, so there will be videos to watch ahead of time, and in the class we'll be watching some of the videos, we'll be discussing some of the errors, we are running some of the examples, and, and really talking about uh, what we've been, what we've been seeing in the video. It obviously is happening in Puerto Rico, which for those of you who join us from Texas or other exotic places, is a great reason to come back to Puerto Rico. It is in San Juan, in the beautiful facilities. And if you're wondering whether I like PowerPoint, the answer is yes. <laughs> All right, I can see you're excited. You've seen some examples. We've talked about artificial intelligence. You want to join. What do you need to do? Well. You can remember this really long URL, or you can go to bit.ly and just go to bit.ly slash AI Sagrada, and it will take you to the actual registration page for the course. The course itself is $235 for Sagrada. We're opening up a max of 15 participants so we can keep the class small and make it very interactive. Uh, and again, you will be, you, well, you can see the grading that will depend on class and form participation as well as your final project. And uh, you'll have a uh, digital certificate that you can link to a LinkedIn account or et cetera that saying, hey, yes, I took the practical deep learning for coders class via University of Dallas and uh, so the class something will be there on your, uh, your, on your profile. Now, you have to promise one thing if you're going to take the class. You are not allowed to use artificial intelligence to create a terminator. Skynet or anything that's going to be evil, okay? So you can only use this for good. Right, right Ani? <laughs> so now we have, I was going to show you. The, uh, there was one question in the chat why PyTorch versus the TensorFlow? Um, so the, it's a good question. PyTorch is, PyTorch and TensorFlow are both very sophisticated languages. Fast AI, which rides on top of PyTorch, actually makes deep learning even easier to use and even more streamlined. And it will do a lot of things. You will see that the amount of code that you would need to do the same thing using fast AI driving PyTorch is significantly less than the amount of code you need using TensorFlow or Keras or something similar. So, so, so it's really an easy way to do it. And if you want to, there's nothing stopping you from going into the PyTorch code and either modifying it or some things you want to do. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. And, and I would argue that the PyTorch is more efficient. Uh, it seems to be more efficient and more cutting edge. Yeah, there's certainly a lot. I mean, there's a lot of development on both yeah. sides. But, um, you're not missing out. Uh, so I am going to grab the screen. Um, So what Adam's going to do while he does that, um, I'm going to show you an example of fast AI in action. And so he's going to use Jupyter, which is an interactive uh, Python environment. Okay. So, so Paul, Paul's, step, Paul's, Paul's example earlier was using uh, Mathematica. We're using uh, Jupyter, which is what we're going to actually use in the course. Um, this is a, a company called Paperspace, and they have actually hosted Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter is just a programming environment. You can think of it as a spreadsheet for code. Um, I'm running one of their uh, GPU machines right here, um, and it costs about 50 cents an hour. Um, and uh, it's already running. I left it running. I spent a whole 50 cents <laughs> sitting here waiting for everybody. Um, so here it is. So I, I, I was just popping up a web browser. This is what it looks like when you, when you jump into it. I have a Jupyter Notebook uh, already open here, uh, which is one of the lessons uh, that's available. So this is what a Jupyter Notebook looks like. Um, basically, these, there, there are cells here which are text, which you can read. Uh, there are cells which you can execute. Uh, if, you hit, if you click on the cell and hit Shift and Return, it executes that. So the little 23 over here means that it's the 23rd cell to execute, because I, before class, I ran through all these and made sure they worked. Um, Here's uh, some Python code, which is going to import the fast AI library. Um, 
here is a very simple line of code. Uh, I'm setting a batch size to 64. So when the neural net that we're going to show here in a second uh, is trained, it's trained on batches of data. So these are groups of images, basically, that we're going to train on. And so we're going to, this particular machine can handle 64 at a time uh, on this GPU, so we're going to use uh, 64. Uh, the, the problem that we're going to work, you're going to see here in a second, is, is a pet classifier. So it's a picture of an animal, and we're going to tell you what size, what kind of animal it is. Um, Fast AI has a. Can we just sorry. say one thing? Just if you look at no 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 go go up the uh, that, that yeah that so you can see that this this model comes from a paper that was published right? it's a research paper and in 2012 the best they could do was 59 percent accuracy and that required you can see here it required they had to do a lot of work just pre-processing and and to get to that 59 percent accuracy and that was state of the art in 2012 so now seven years later you'll see what um, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is the same data set, but the same type of data set. Um, so it turns out that in, in uh, Jupyter, for instance, uh, you can say help, and you can get help on the, the various functions. So if you don't open something up, you can just open a cell, ask for help on a particular function. This is a function that untars data. So this is built, this is a fast AI function, which grabs some data from the internet, pulls it into my machine, and un unpacks it. That's what untar does. Um, it, it returns a variable, which is a path to where those, those that data is located. Um, let's skip through some of this. I'm just, I'm just adjusting the path. So, so this, what this does is it goes through and finds all of the, the image paths. And um, so it loads an array of F names, which are all the images. And you can see here that these are, like, you know, this is a beagle, this is a American pit bull, and so on. These are just file names, right? Um, what I'm going to do next is pull those file names into what's called a data bunch. So when you train in fast AI, you need uh, basically a, a, a bunch of data that you're gonna, you're gonna pass into your neural network. Um, this code here grabs the images from those paths using a regular expression, um, which is basically, it, it, it breaks down this path here and pulls out the name of the animal. So for instance, Beagle from, from here was pulled out by this regular expression. So this, this data bunch uh, method goes through and it pulls, it pulls in all this data, right? It puts it into a format that you can use to train. Um, the, uh, it's always good to look at the data to make sure it makes sense. So here is the data as it's been pulled in. So this is a show batch, which shows a bunch of uh, the data that's now in our data method. Um, so there's a Russian blue cat, there's a Pomeranian dog, a pug, your chart. So these, these look correct, right? So it looks like we pulled in the data correctly. We thought there's so it looks like the right names attached to the, oh, this is cute. Uh, okay. Um, so the, um, the metadata, or the data that we have inside the data bunch, uh, are, are broken into classes. So this algorithm is going to classify images. Sure. So it's an image classifier neural network. And so these are the classes that we're going we're to train on. So it turns out that there is a pre-trained neural net. So we talked about uh, uh, how neural nets work. Generally, if you want to start from scratch, you just take a neural net, you can build it, you can fill it with random numbers, and you go through the training. That can take a long time. It turns out there are these neural nets that are really already good at image recognition in general. So ResNet is one of those. So we're going to take ResNet because it already knows a lot about uh, images. And we're going to, sorry. It's but all same. sorts of images or just animal it, images? Uh, all, all sorts of images. Sorts of Right, so it's it's good. It was used for an ImageNet competition um, to train on, on all sorts of images. And so the interesting thing here is that we're taking that, which just kind of knows about images, and now we're going to fine tune it with our data set. And so now we're going to take it, we're going to fine tune it, we're going to train it to, to understand pet breeds, the pet breeds that we have in our data, in our data set. So we create a, a CNN, a convolutional neural network, um, inside of uh, inside of fast AI, this is what it looks like. We're not going to get into it, but, but it's, these are these are the layers. This is what they look like in terms of the code. Yeah. Right? If you remember when you were asking me on Mathematica, that line was just the layers. Mm -hmm. That was like six layers, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, this has yeah. 34 and 34 layers. Oh, okay. yeah. So it's a much more sophisticated, but obviously you can do more than just add two numbers. Yes. Yeah. So 
so there's a there's a training uh, method in fast AI called fit one cycle. And so I'm going to run it here. It should take about two minutes. But we don't have to actually wait for it to finish. But the idea is that it's now running on that GPU. So it's taking that data set. It loaded all those those images in. It, it kept some of them aside. Right. Remember we have to we have to have a validation set as well as the training set. So it's going to it's going to run through uh, uh, training that neural net. Um, and since since let's go ahead. I know we're a little bit running, running a little bit late on the amount of time. So you can see here uh, the first epoch. So epoch is uh, a round, think of it as a round of training. Um, we're at about 10%, uh, 11% error rate. Um, remember the uh, paper was at 56% accuracy, mm -hmm. right? So here we're already almost 90% accurate after just one round of training on you know, GPU that caught 50 cents an hour. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. Now it's already down. Now we're up to ninety-two percent, ninety-one percent, right? Um, so, so I'm going to let that. I'm not going to actually make us wait till that, till that ends, till that finishes. But basically, you know, it gets, it gets pretty accurate. We've been, we've been look back at it. Um, I read it before class, and basically, what we can do is we can look at what, uh, how well it did, right? And so here is uh, a group of images that are um, showing the, the prediction, the actual, um, and then the loss, right? So here, here are the sort of the top mistakes that it made. Um, so it, it, mistook, it mistook this pincher for, um, it predicted this, this pitfall was actually a pincher, and it's not, right? It turns out pitfalls and pinchers kind of look the same, right? So that's you know, kind of understandable. Um, you know, this cat, this bangle, um, is actually, uh, or is predicted to be an Egyptian now, whatever that is, and it's actually a man, right? And so you can see here that uh, you know, here's a here's a boxer versus a, a bulldog, a bulldog, right? So these are these are uh, pretty close, right? <laughs> Humans would probably make these this, this kind of mistake. Um, in the end, okay, so our, our thing ended up with uh, pretty pretty good accuracy, right? So we got up to an, uh, an error rate of Seven percent, um, not bad. So ninety-three percent accuracy. Um, here's another way to look at the data. Now, once we've trained it, we can look at uh, what's called a confusion matrix. And so this shows, you know, across between which which animals were correct and which ones were incorrect. So you can see along the diagonal are the ones that were correct. You can see here, like this 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 line that says ragdoll. Um, it thought nine of the ragdolls. Um, See, nine of the Burmans were actually ragdolls and vice versa. Um, and so, you know, we can also look at this. Uh, look at this um, in in the uh, just just in the top results, here, right? So, so it, it's most confused, right? So it confused five of the the Russian blues for the short hairs. Um, so it's still pretty pretty impressive, right? That you can train something in, in a few minutes and, and get something that's Pretty accurate. Um, no, but you can learn of the ragdoll. So you can you can teach it to learn that in that particular breed it's making some mistakes. A right? mistake. So you can train the you can train it on more data, on more data. Um, or you can use a bigger network. Um, so in fact, in this notebook that we have, the next uh, and I'm not going to go through it because I actually did train this earlier today, um, and it took you know 10 to 20 minutes to begin through. And so, but. But the next step would be to un unfreeze this, do a little more training. Um, you can adjust learning rates. So we're not, not going to get all the stuff. There's a lot of stuff here that we're not going to mm -hmm. talk about today. But there are ways to like focus on different kinds of learning rates to make these things work faster. Um, we talked about uh, ResNet. The, the ResNet 50 is a larger, is a larger network than the uh, ResNet 25, right? Uh, 30, 30, 30, 30, 34. Sorry, 34. So. So yeah, so you can also train with larger networks um, and get better accuracy. So um, the Resident 50 takes longer. Um, I ran this earlier today. I think it wasn't so bad. Seven minutes, right? To train. Um, I'll actually go back up because if you go, well, you can already see the error rate at the end of that seven minutes. Yeah. You were down to you know, five percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this this is. Um, but that's really all I wanted to discuss in terms of just give you a feel for how this is what you're actually going to be doing in class. 
And so the assignments will be, you know, understand how to build test AI code using Jupyter notebooks, um, and and we'll do not just not just in the orientation, but lots of other kinds of deep learning. For the final project, can we choose what we want to yes. develop? Yes, uh, you can definitely choose what you want to develop, and, and you should choose. And hopefully, it does something interesting, or maybe work related, or just um, hobby, whatever. Okay. Question that you're yes. curious about. Yes. So, yes. Absolutely. Cool. So, you've seen, hopefully, this has been interesting and, and enjoyable, right? We talked about both the history of deep learning, we talked about some of the applications, you've seen some examples, you know some of how it works, you know? If someone asks you, do you know how neural networks work? You say, well, it's the universal approximation theorem, obviously. And I'll probably leave you alone. <laughs> and, and you know at least some of the things that you need. The great pickup line. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for coming, and we hope that you may be interested in taking the class, but in any case, I you know, hope that you learn something about artificial intelligence and deep learning. And uh, if you take one thing away, everybody, you know, as long as you have some programming experience, everybody can learn um, how to do this. And there are many places you can, you can, uh, you can apply it. So if you have questions, uh, we're happy to stick around for Q and A. We're gonna we finished. We finished 23 minutes ahead of schedule. So